And uh, we're joined by Sean Wheelock, Art's co-author on Is This Legal, his 2014 book. That's right. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate that. Yeah. Is This Legal, the inside story of the first UFC from the man who created it. Uh, that was really a labor of love for Art and myself. We wrote it together, but make no mistake, it's his words, it's his story, it's his first person account, it's his memoir of the time in his life when he created the UFC, culminating with UFC 1. Now, Sean is known as the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships on uh, television commentator, uh, uh, alongside his partner, Chris Lytle, and... Uh, you know, he has all that world that he's dealing with. How do you set time aside to write a book and set up this book with art? How'd you meet? Well, at the time I was commentating for Bellator. And the story is that in 2011, I don't know why I got it in my head that I wanted to meet Art Davey. And I asked people and people said, well, I know Campbell McLaren. No, oh, I know Bob Meyerowitz. No, I don't want to meet those people. I want to meet Art Davey. And... Like you, I, I, I really pride myself on loving MMA history. I'm somebody who watched UFC 1 live. We talk about that in the book, in the afterward, that my mom paid the $14.95. I was a kid in Shawnee, Kansas, and uh, I made a VHS recording of that, and literally that event changed my young life. I never <laughs> felt the same way about fighting or sports or, or anything after UFC 1 on November 12, 1993. That's the poster behind me signed by Art, by the way. So in 2011, when I was commentating for Bellator MMA, I just got this idea. And I'm a pretty decent Google researcher. So because nobody knew Art and I'm asking around and I start Google researching and I find an old press release and it has a 702 area phone, uh, area code phone number on it. Those of us who work in fighting in the U.S. know that 702 is Nevada. I thought, okay, this is going to be something. I cold called the number. It was in July of 2011. Art Davey answers. And literally, my agenda was just to say, my name is Sean Wheelock. I want to thank you for giving me this career, for all the pleasure you've done or you've given me. You know, th this, this, your vision has not only changed my life, it's changed the lives of millions of people. I thought it, in my mind it would be one call. Thank you very much. That's it. Instead, an amazing friendship was born on that day to the point where Art's really become a later in life father to me. Uh, he's uh, the true grandfather of my girls, Ellie and Hadley. They call him Grandpa Art. It's gone beyond friendship into a family member status with Art and myself. That's that's really good to hear. Now, let me ask you. So like a true MMA fan and, and historian, you know, around 2011, you got you had a hunch. You had a hunch, Art was something special, more than just a Bob Meyer. Like Bob Meyer, which would be a great book also, you know, but it would be so different, different types of stories, much more legal, you know, arts, people's stories, arts, you know, the man, when did, when did he cinch it for you? You talked to him. How fast did you know you were right, that there was something special there? Well, literally in the first phone conversation, just his charisma. And I, I was smart to the business by then. I, you have to think, this is 2011. I'd already commentated Pride. I commentated M1. I'm in my second year of Bellator in 2011. So I'd already been in this game for a while. I was definitely smart to the business. But the charisma of art, the intelligence, the fact that he was so humble, never bragged, never I did this or anything like that. We just hit it off as two people that just hit it off. And we started talking more and more. And I don't know the exact time, but somewhere over the course of the next six months as we're talking and our friendship is really growing and we're having hours and hours of phone conversations. I'll give you a caveat on that in a moment. But I thought, you know, we need to do a book on this because these are amazing stories. And, and I think I'm one of the hardest of hardcore MMA fans in the world. And I didn't know any of these stories. And I'm thinking... If I don't know these stories as someone who's a hardcore fan, someone who watched UFC one live, someone who works in the business, how many people who, outside of those who were there and lived it know these stories? The caveat I was going to say is as our friendship developed, that was the time when uh, our, our daughter Hadley, who's now 12 years old, she was a baby. So my wife would go to sleep early. Hadley would go to sleep early. Our older daughter, Ellie, was six years old at the time. So there were a lot of early nights in my house when I thought, I'm just going to call Art and we'll just talk. And over that six-month period, 
that's when it really developed and grew. Initially on the book, I envisioned it as like, we would talk to John McCarthy. We would talk to Horion Gracie, Bob Myrowitz, Campbell McLaren. We would talk to Bill Wallace, uh, uh, talk uh, to Gerard Gordo. But every story I heard, I thought, you know what? All roads lead back to art. And I thought, you know, this is art story. The story of UFC is art story. Because John Myer, uh, Bob Myrowitz, brought in by art. Campbell McLaren, same thing. Big John McCarthy, Horion Gracie, all roads lead back to art. And even though we hadn't started writing or recording even, I just did a mental pivot. And I thought, this is the book. The, the book is not this third person journalistic. This is the creation of the UFC. The book is this real memoir, Art Davies saying how he created the UFC and how he was able to get this proverbial snowball rolling and picking up people like Corey on Gracie and big John McCarthy. Yeah. I think, you know, in today's media world, it gets lost because he's, he's not a huge personality, like, you know, take over the room unless he needs to be, but he was very subtle in, in where, where he inserted himself and he really was running the show from the very beginning. I mean, I just picture him, you know, returning letters to you know getting let you know, the idea of putting you know the magazine ads to solicit fighters receiving the letters and then not just junking them actually responding to them you know letter Absolutely. by letter and really doing doing the dirty work it was him no it was and, and art really is is the most charming charismatic person who i've ever met the thing and those of us who know and love art davy can tell you he is not defined by being the creator of the UFC and the de facto inventor of MMA. It's one thing that he did in his life, and he's done a lot of things. He owned a car dealership. He was an ad man. He was a Marine in Vietnam. He's been married four times. He was partners in a television production company. Art's had this amazing life. And going back to the book, the difference for me it, it, between a memoir and an autobiography. An autobiography is like, this is literally my whole life. Memoir is, this is one little slice of my life. So the book is written as a memoir. It, it's with a little backstory, just framing who Art is, how he grew up in Brooklyn. He was high school roommates for a year at New York Military Academy with Donald Trump, which is in, absolutely bizarre and incredible when you think about that. The guy who creates the UFC and Donald Trump are high school roommates at New York Military Academy. It's insane. The uh, world works out that way sometimes. But Art had, had done so many things. He did not let this define him. And that's why when people say, you know, does it make you sick that you sold a, a billion dollar company, multi-billion dollar company? He's the first one to say he didn't have the capital to get it to where it was. Art has a great quote which is he feels like he had a baby, he put the baby up for adoption, and that baby grew up to be the president of the United States. Art is the opposite of bitter. He has no regrets. He is so proud of what he, he achieved, but he's proud of a lot of things that he achieved in his life, including being a, a Marine, including his car dealership in the 70s, including uh, being the de facto grandfather to my girls, Ellie and Hadley. That's what's so cool and so refreshing about Art. It's not this, oh, one hit wonder or I did this. It's, yeah, that's something that happened. And that was 30 years ago. And look at all I did before and look at all I did since. Okay, so it's a memoir. But how does this memoir get on the silver screen? Because there's rumors out there. What can you tell us about that? Because I think that's the, uh, the best end state for this. Art is somebody whose story should be in, in, in reach by to, to as many people because it inspires in many ways even if you don't like fighting i'm sure you know and the, plus his personality the whole brooklyn who would play him you know we need a young joe pesci or something <laughs> oh, i i i thought that i thought adam sandler but um uh if this movie ever gets made wow. uh, art and i are just consultants we're not producers and we're not casting directors on it i could after, especially after seeing um, Uncut Gems, I would think Adam Sandler would be perfect on that. But the story of that, so the book comes out, you know, the book does does okay. It, you know, it it's a, a smaller publisher, 
So books like that aren't going to sell a million copies. But the, the book did okay. I know we got the number one in sports books on Amazon, which I felt really, really good about. But from the very beginning, we started getting a lot of calls from producers. And, you know, you'll get calls, oh, is this available? And it'll be a producer or an agent. And then you never hear from them again. But uh, we came to deal, or we came to terms with a producer maybe four months, five months after the book was released. That producer and her partners held the option. Um, they renewed the option. That option expired. It, before that option expired, another producer came to us and said, if that option ever expires and the people you're with choose not to renew, please give me first crack. That ultimately is who we went with. So we've been with that producer, I think, since 2019. Um, and they move it along. It Neither Art nor I are very passive <laughs> individuals. I don't think you can be in this game and be a passive individual. In the movie making process, you have to be a passive individual because these are really forces out of our control. We have a great producer who we believe in. That producer, he's getting it to studios, screenwriters, scripts. But then what happens, happens. You know, you hear these stories and as a lifelong movie fan, but I've only worked in fighting and live sports television. I've not worked in film or scripted television or theater or anything like that. But you hear these stories about, oh, it took eight years to get this movie made. It took 12 years to get this movie made. You think, how is that? How is that possible? I understand how that's possible now. I am I'm the most optimistic person you will ever meet in the world. So true to character, I'm extremely optimistic. We are so close on this. Obviously, the the uh, SAG strike and the WGA strike have slowed things down. But what I can say is that we have a producer we believe in. We have a script that's nearly finished. I didn't write it, by the way. It's real Hollywood people who wrote the script. Uh, we have a director attached and we have a studio who said that they will make this movie. From there, what happens, happens. I can tell you this, though. Yeah, obviously, there's going to be some money, and that's going to be great. It's about legacy for me. Doing this book was never about money. When we sold the film rights, it was never about money. Money's nice, don't get me wrong, but it's not about that. It's about the legacy. It's about, for me personally, as someone who really loves Art Davey and sees him like a family member, for people to understand no, it wasn't Dana White. Dana White's done some amazing things with the UFC. The UFC would not be where it is without Dana White. But it's not Dana White who created the UFC. It's not by, by Myrowitz. It's certainly, despite what he says, Hunter, uh, sorry, Campbell McLaren, um, it, it's Art Davey. And what would be so satisfying for me with the movie is for people to really understand that Art Davey is this guy. This was his vision. He had to bring in a lot of people. He had to raise a lot of money. But the UFC does not exist without Art Davey. And MMA as we know it does not exist without Art Davey. I think there would be something that would kind of look like MMA because we were seeing it moving that way with what was going on in Japan in the late 80s and early 90s. But MMA would not look like what it does without Art Davey. And there certainly would not be a UFC without Art Davey. That's indisputable. For sure. And I remember attending uh, the UFCs when Art was still in charge and then the transition all the way through, you know, when Peretti was there and then uh, when Dana took over. And Art had a very special touch uh, live, you know, the way he commanded the room and stuff. He used to line the fighters up and pay them with a, a check in an envelope. And, yeah. and that was yeah. kind of the ceremony after, you know, at the after fight party. And then there was a, a brawl at one of them. And they had to cancel that. But Art had his own very personal touch. Why don't you close off with, with one of those old-time stories that you le learned in the book or that you learned for the book from Art that uh, very few people know? So, yeah, uh, Art is – here's one thing I can tell you about Art, and I'll, I'll hit on a specific story. But here, here's something that I can tell you about Art. He is incapable of holding a grudge. Even some people like Campbell McLaren, who've said a lot of not true things, a lot of night, uh, not nice things. Campbell McLaren called Art a couple of weeks ago. Art told me, Art's fine with him. Uh, Bob Myrowitz has not done the greatest and the nicest things to Art. Art's fine with that. Art's incapable of holding a grudge. 
the fighters, um, when I saw Vitor Belfort, I commentated Vitor Belfort versus Jacare Souza in boxing on the undercard of Roy Jones and Anthony Pettis in April. And I was telling Vitor how close I am to art and his eyes lit up. When I've talked to Randy Couture about that, when I saw the late Pat Smith, when I met Gerard Gordo, <laughs> Zane Frazier, the time uh, first time I met Hoist Gracie, art impacts people a very special way on this. But I think the great Art Davies story, and this is in the book, is at the rules meeting. Um, so it's the night before UFC one, and they're in a conference room uh, at the Executive Inn and Suites in Denver. And everyone starts arguing about, well, can I wear a glove? Can I wear gloves? Can I wear a groin protector? Can you need the groin? Can you eye gouge? Can you headbutt? Well, can I wear my pancreas boots? Can I wear my boxing trunks? All of this. And Art saw literally this show turning the dust, UFC one on the eve of it, in front of him. And he was able to stay calm. He was able to bring everybody back together. You have a room full of alphas. This is at a time, 1993, when you could be a black belt and a lifelong practitioner of a martial art and be blissfully unaware of another martial art. You have to think this is super early internet. Um, this is before streaming. So a lot of these guys thought the others were fake. They were phonies. They were interlopers. There was a lot of hostility. It's not the camaraderie of an MMA show that you see now. You still obviously will see rivalries, but there's still a brother and sisterhood. There's the camaraderie. That didn't exist. This show was about to explode. There was about to be an all-out brawl with the eight fighters plus the two alternates plus their camps plus the various hangers-on who were jammed into this little conference room in downtown Denver, Colorado. Art stayed cool. He got it on track. He brought it all together. The next night was UFC 1, and that's history right there. Yeah, I... I... I've heard uh, a lot of the details of that story, and we interviewed Bob Myerowitz. Bob Myerowitz wasn't even at UFC one. No, no, UFC that was, two. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that I'm glad that you said that. And, and look, you know, Bob Myerowitz believed. I'll say this for Bob Myerowitz: he, he's not always said the nicest things about art, and he's not always been the most magnanimous human being. When HBO, Showtime, ESPN told Art Davy no, Bob Myerowitz told him yes. Bob Myrowitz wasn't fully on board. He didn't even come to UFC one. He was the guy who came out of music. His business semaphore entertainment group was basically doing uh, music pay-per-views and comedy pay-per-views like Andrew Dice Clay, late eighties, early nineties in a few rando sporting events. Like when they had battle of the sexes too in tennis, when Martina Navratilova played Jimmy Connors in Atlantic city, but Bob Myrowitz wasn't a guy who thought this is going to be huge. History shows that he wasn't there. Full credit to Bob Meyerowitz. He eventually embraced the vision. He ultimately bought the UFC from Art Davey and Horion Gracie and then brought back Art to run the company. But you're absolutely right. He was not there. He didn't really know what he had, clearly, or he would have been in Denver on that night. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he, he, he did get in the trenches and fight for years because, you know, the court battles that Bob Meyerowitz would do in a book you know, state by state and being sued all over the place. And, you know, he was the New York City lawyer. He felt that was his ballpark and he handled that stuff, took the pressure off art and let art do the matchmaking, which really makes art an artist. Yeah, no, that's right. And, you know, the story of that is after UFC 5, um, Bob Meyerowitz, uh, who, who had the pay-per-view rights, and had become a principal in the UFC, but did not own the UFC. The UFC was owned through you from its creation through UFC five by Art Davy, Horion Gracie, and then they raised one hundred twelve thousand five hundred dollars from uh, twenty nine different investors. Some as as little as a couple of thousand dollars. Almost everybody, if not everybody, in that twenty nine were either Gracie Jiu Jitsu students, personal friends of Art, or personal friends of the Gracie family. But that was the ownership group. Bob Myrowitz wasn't an owner. He made an offer. The offer was accepted after UFC 5. That's why you didn't see uh, Hoist Gracie or Horian Gracie after UFC 5. Art Davey thought, I'll sit out my no compete and I'm going to launch another one of these things. But instead, Bob Myrowitz, a couple of weeks after this sale, came to Art and said, you know what? I really need you. 
So from UFC 6 all the way through December of 1997, UFC Japan, Art Davey basically had his exact same job. But you're right, to a certain extent, the pressure was off because now he's not the owner. He's got Bob Myrowitz, who's fighting the battles. Art was still fighting, but he was now a, sal a salaried person. He wasn't someone who's thinking, God, I have to make these decisions <laughs> to get everybody paid. So in a lot of ways, the pressure was off, but it also changed the dynamic. I mean, I saw this firsthand when I was at Bellator, when my boss, Bjorn Rebney, went from being the owner to being an employee when Viacom bought. It changes the dynamic of things, but Bob Myrowitz definitely played a huge, pivotal role in the UFC. You know, there's no UFC without Art Davey. And then Bob Myrowitz took that gap after Art left to get to the Fertitas. And then there's certainly no UFC without the Fertitas and Dana White. Yeah, well, Sean, I want to thank you for joining us. Any time we can dedicate to art is time well spent, uh, as you both, as you, you know, you know, and I know. And uh, I'm grateful for the time. Uh, why don't you give me some closing words or, you know, send art a little closing message here. This is yeah, no, I, I appreciate stuff. it so much. And, and you're so nice to have me and you're so nice to give art his due. And, you know, you, you're a person, I'm a person who's been touched by art, Dave, and we know just what a magnificent human being he is. Um, I'm rooting for this movie, obviously. In the meantime, if people want to buy the book, you can find it on Amazon. Every once in a while, you'll see a straight copy in Barnes & Noble, but this book's been out for nine years now. So Barnes & Noble, it's unlikely you'll see it. You can go to Amazon. The best price is isthislegalthebook.com, isthislegalthebook.com. That's some of the inventory art and I have. You can get autographed copies, personalized autograph copies from art. And uh the movie we're thinking good thoughts for that and again it's really the legacy of art um i am so appreciative that you gave me this time and and that you're part of the cult of art davy as am i exactly the cult of art i love uh, that's a great place to end thank you very much